So next, let's look at some graphical illustrations. So again, we have this function q equals to g of v. And um, for the first graph here, so as we can see, this is a smooth curve, right? And uh, suppose we want to find out the limit of q when v approaches n. So from this graph, we can see that when, when v equals to n here, q equals to l. And because uh, this is a smooth curve, so when v is less than n, but it's very close to n, so it is approaching n from the left side. And as v is closer and closer to n from the left side, we can see that the q will be very closer to l. So as v approaches n from the left side, Q will also approach L here. And uh, when V is larger than M, but it's closer and closer to N. Again, the Q, the function Q, will also be approaching L. And because it's a smooth curve, so there's value defined for every um, value of V. So in this case, we said that the left side limit equals to the right side limit. Because whether or not you approach from the left side or the right side, the Q function will approach to L from both sides. So because the left side limit equals to the right side limit, so we can see that the limit of Q when V, equal, when v approaches M exists and the value is L. And for the second graph here, so this curve is not smooth because there is a sharp turning point here, a sharp turning point. But again, when v equals to n, the function q equals to l. And uh, when you approach, when v approaches m from the left side, q will approach l. And when v is larger than m, but it's closer to n, q will also be closer to l. So no matter how or which side you choose to approach the m, um, the function q will approach uh, will approach the number l from both sides. So although this is not a smooth curve, but um, from both sides, the function will approach q. So in this case, the left side limit will also be equal to the right side limit. And the limit of Q when V equal when V approaches M will also exist and equals to L. But for the lot for the other two graphs here, <clears throat> so for example, for the third graph, so this kind of function is called a step function. So we can see that when v is smaller than m, the l function equals to l1, the q function equals to l1. And when v is larger or equal to m, it will suddenly change to another value, l2. So if you look at closely, there is an empty circle here. So this is an empty circle. So this empty circle means that there's no value defined at this point. Because when v is less than m, no matter how you choose the v value, um, the q function will equal to l1. But when v equals to m, it will suddenly jump to l2. So there's no value for the function. So because when v equals to m, so when v equals to m, the function will suddenly jump to l2. So I put an empty circle here because you cannot choose this value here. Only this little point. Because at this point, v is equal to l2, not l1. So I put empty circle here. So this is called step function. When v changes, 
from less than n to larger or equal to n, the value of the function will suddenly change. So in this case, when we approach this n from the left side, so from the left side here, so we can see that the value of q should always equal to L1. No matter how you choose the value of that v, how close v is close to m, as long as v is smaller than m, the value of the function is equal to L1. So the left side limit, the limit of q, when v approaches m minus, right, from the left side, equals to L1. But when v is larger than m and is closer, closer to m, no matter how, well, you matter how, what what kind of value you choose for for the value v, as long as it is larger than m, the value of the function should be equal to L2. So the limit of q when v approaches m from the right side will also be L2. So in this case, we can see that the left side limit is not equal to the right side limit. So we see we, we say that the limit of Q when V approaches M does not exist because we cannot find the same value um, for the left side and right side limit. So this kind of function is called discontinuous function when V equals to M. It's discontinuous because there's a sudden change in the value of function q here when v equals to n. So in this case, if you, there's no limit uh, for the for the sudden change here, but for other values like um, somewhere here or somewhere here, uh, the limit exists, right? Because uh, for the right uh, for the right part and the left part here. Um, the function is continuous. But in the middle part, when v equals to m, only in this point, the function is discontinuous. So there's no limit in the discontinuous part, uh, in the discontinuous point for the function. And for the last graph, and it's also discontinuous when v equals to m, because for the left part here, when v is less than m, but approaches m, we can see that um, the value of q is approaching negative infinite. Right? Negative infinite, if we extend this line, it should be like this. But when v is larger than m, uh, and the v is closer and closer to m, approaching m, the value of q should be close to, should be approaching uh, the positive infinite. So there's a discontinuous point when v equals to m. So if you approach v from, uh, sorry, if you approach m from the left side, the limit should be negative infinite. And if you approach m from the right side, it should be positive infinite. So again, the left side limit doesn't equal to the right side limit. And in this case, because there's a discontinuous point here when v equals to n, we say that there's no uh, limit when v approaches n. So from the four graphs, we can uh, know that to determine whether or not uh, there's a limit for the, for the curve, uh, it's important to determine that whether or not there's a discontinuous point if it's a smooth curve, or not smooth, but uh, continuous, right? Continuous means that there's no, um, um, there's no like sudden change in the value of the function. Or there's no jump of the value of the function. Or there's no, um, right? The, the function should be um, smooth, or um, the value should be continuous. But there's no like a um, turning point here, or oh, sorry, the jump point here, or um, the two lines here, right? 
So it should be a continuous function. Not, um, so we can see the third and fourth graph. Um, the function is separated in different parts. Right, so in this case, the turning point or the the, the uh, discontinuous point is um, there's no limit for the discontinuous point. So if we don't note um, if there's a like limit existing, so you can draw the graph by yourself and look at the point and to see whether or not it is continuous on both sides. So the third topic is the evaluation of a limit. So I give you two examples here. First, suppose the v, uh, suppose q function is like this, and we want to find uh, the limit of q when v approaches one. So from the function, we can see that when v equals to one, the function is undefined, right? Because when v equals to one, um, the denominator here is zero. So, but we cannot have a zero a de denominator to be zero, so the function is not defined. So we can now just uh, plug in v equals to one to the q function and to find out the limit. So what we're gonna do is to try to transform the ratio to a form in which v will not appear in the denominator. So we want to get rid of the one minus v in from the denominator, and then we can plug in v equals to one. So q function is this. So for the numerator here, um, v, one minus v square can be written as one plus v times one minus v, right? And then we can cancel the one minus v here. So Q is just equal to one plus V. But pay attention that V should not be equal to one. Although for the transformation function here, V is free to be anyone, right? V is free to be any number. But for the original function here, V is not equal to one. So although we transform the function to a second form, a simplified form, but the domain should not be changed. Right. Domain is uh, all the values that V can choose for the original function. So for the original function here, V cannot be one. So after you transform the function, V still cannot be one. We cannot change um, the values that V can choose for the original function. Okay. So for this function, uh, if we draw the graph, it should be very easy look like this, right? It's a continuous function. So when v equals to one, the limit is just uh, when we plug v equals to one to this function. So this is just a one plus one equals to two. So for the second example, q equals to two v plus five, divided by v plus one. I want to find out the limit of q when v, equal, when v approaches positive de, um, infinity. So again, from the original function here, when v approaches the positive um, infinite, infinity. So for the, uh, for the numerator here, it should also be approaching the positive infinite. And for the denominator still, it approaches to positive infinite, right? So because V approaches the positive infinite, so both V plus one and the two V plus five approach the positive infinite. So if you, as we said that the positive infinite is not, um, it's not a number. So we can now do the calculation like uh, uh, infinite divided by infinite. So we cannot do this kind of calculation. So what we're going to do is to get rid of this positive infinite problem 
by transform this kind of function to a form such that we can get rid of the uh, numerator here. I get rid of the v from the numerator. So there's only one positive infinite left. So here, the 2v plus 5 equals to 2 times v plus 1, and then plus 3. Right. So in this case, we can get rid of the v plus 1 from the numerator here. So this equals to 2 plus 3 over v plus 1. So here it's very easy to find the solution because when v approaches the positive infinite, v plus 1 also um, approaches the positive infinite, right? But when we take the inverse, so 1 over 1 plus v, so this thing should be close to 0. Right, because positive infinite is a very, very large number. So we'll take the inverse, the so one over a very, very, a very, very large positive number. So this thing should be just a close to zero. Right, it should be a very, very small number and close to zero. So if we time this thing by three, it should also be close to zero. So we know that the second part, that second term here, will be closing or will be approaching zero when v becomes a very positive number. So the limit of q when v approaches the positive infinite is just 2, because the second term here is, is approaching to a very, very small number. And so we can cancel this when we when we um, talk about the limit. So Q is just um, um, the limit of Q when V um, becomes positive infinite is just a two. And we get rid of this small term here. Okay, so for the, um, the section three here, we talk about some of the theorems just some basic theorems. So um, first theorem for the single function, again, q equals to g of v. So theorem one, if q equals to a v plus b. So that means that this is a linear function, right? a times v plus b. It's a linear function. So all the linear functions are continuous because it's just a straight line. It's just a straight line here. So there's no uh, jump, um, so no sudden change of the value. So it's just a smooth curve and straight line, so it's continuous. So if q is a linear function, then the limit of q when v approaches m is just a times m plus b or the limit of q when v approaches m is just when we um, plug in the m into the function. And a and b are constants. So for example, q equals to 5v plus 7. And so when v approaches 2, we can just uh, plug in v equals to 2 to this function and to find out the result, which is 17. Right. This is because we know that it's continuous function. And so when v approaches to from left side or the right side, the value should be approaching um, when we plug in 2, number 2, in the function. So this is 17. And the second, if, g equals to, if q equals to g, v equals to b, which is a constant, then the limit of q when v approaches m is also b. So q equals to b, it means that q is a constant function. So constant function looks like this. No matter what v you choose, the function q should always equal to b. It's a flat straight line parallel to the x-axis, right? So this is a constant function. 
no matter how, what kind of v you choose, the uh, q function will always equal to a constant b. So in this case, again, this is a continuous function. So when v approaches m from left side or right side, it should be always equal to the number b, right? Because no matter how you choose number v, uh, the value of v, the function will always equal to b. So when v equals to a number m, q should also be approaching b or just equal to b. And third, if q equals to v, the limit of q when v approaches m is just m. And if q uh, equals to v to the k, the limit of q when v approaches m is just like m to the k. So q equals to v, it means that if we draw the graph, it should be like this. So there's 45 degree. Right. So when v equals to 2, q will also equal to 2. And when v equals to 3, q will also equal to 3. So when v approaches m, q, the limit of q will be just m. Right? Because again, this is a straight line. It's a straight line and it's continuous. So when v approaches m, q also approaches m. And the limit of q will be just n. And again, if q equals to v to the k, so all the x to the k function are continuous. So when, when q equals to v to the k, so the limit of q when v approaches n is just to plug in the n to the function. So for example, q equals to v uh, cube. So limit of q when v approaches 2 is just 2 to the third, 2 to the 2 cube, right? The cube of 2. So it's 8. So we just plug in v equals to 2 to the function and to find out the value. For two functions here, we have q1 and q2. So q1 equals to g of v and q2 equals to h of v. So they have the same independent variable. They have the same independent variable v. If both functions satisfy limit of q1 when v approaches m is l1, the limit of q2 when v approaches the same number m is, q, is l2. And l1 and l2 are two finite numbers. Finite. So that means that l1 and l2 are not equal to uh, infinite, or positive infinite or negative infinite. The following theorems are applicable. So theorem 4 is called some difference limit theorem. So if we meet this, this those kind of uh, conditions, then the limit of q1 plus or minus q2 when v approaches m equals to l1 plus or minus l2. So this means that when v approaches the same number m, q1 and q2, the limit of q1 and q2 are l1 and l2 respectively. So we can add them together right? when we talk about L q1 plus or minus q2. We can just add and subtract or subtract l2 from l1 accordingly. And the second theorem is called product limit theorem. So again, we have all the conditions above. And when we are doing the multiplication, q1 times q2, when v approaches to the same number n, right? all the n here are the same, then we can just multiply q1 and um, l1 and l2. And um, the third one is quotient limit. Again, v approaches the same number m, and q1 over q2, the limit 
is just L1 over L2. But pay attention that L2 should not equal to zero. Otherwise, there's not there's no limit for that. Okay. So for example, we want to find out the limit um, of one plus v over two plus v when v approaches zero. So first we need to check um, if these two equations satisfy. Or we can say that we want to check if the two functions um, have this have if there is a limit uh, for the two functions when v approaches zero. And because both of the two functions are linear, and so they are continuous, so when v approaches zero, they are defined. So the limit exists for the two functions. So when uh, so when v approaches zero, the limit of one plus v should be just one. Uh, plug in v equals to zero to this function. And when v approaches to zero, we can plug in the value of v to the second function also because it's continuous, or right, just a straight line. And then the limit is just a two. Okay. So because of this, we can apply the above theorem. So the theorem we are going to apply is theorem six. So the limit of the two um, of the quotient of the two functions when v approaches to the same number zero here should be just one over two. So when we are uh, when you are applying to the uh, for the above theorems, you need to make sure that uh, you should satisfy these preconditions here. But there are some of the conditions that you need to meet for the two functions to be applied for the two, uh, several theorems here.